how, how are you? Doing all right. Well, um, first of all, thanks so much for agreeing to talk to me. I, I know um, you probably like don't you don't like doing interviews. I gathered from the podcast you were on, um, so I'm grateful. Um, could we just maybe start with your background, like, um, what is your background, um, academically, and what drew you to science in the first place? Uh, so I have a PhD in physics, uh, my background's mostly in condensed matter physics, uh, lasers, optics, remote sensing, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I've always wanted to be a physicist, so ever since high school, or even before, never known doing anything else. Um, and as a physicist, I uh, got drawn into uh, military and intelligence research, and then uh, from there, uh, moved over into the intelligence community for the last 25 some odd years. Mm. And... Um what was it about UFOs or UAPs that um, interested you? Um, nothing, actually. It was a, an assignment. Uh, so as a senior intel and military officers get given assignments, um, this one I was asked to do uh, by the undersecretary, the undersecretary of intelligence, um, and when those kinds of people ask, it's uh, usually a good thing to say yes, because generally they don't like it when you say no. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, truth be told, it's a it's an interesting area only because it is a looking for something that is unknown uh, is really the, the same thing in science as it is in the intelligence community. You are trying to find unknown things mm. and determine what they are. And so as a, both a physicist and an intelligence officer, that's sort of the, the sweet spot of things to go do, uh, which is interesting. Mm. Uh, keeping in mind, you know, the, the office was asked to do two missions, uh, both an operational mission and a historical research mission. And so the operational mission is where you know, I would have preferred to spend most of my time. Uh, the historical mission was was necessary by law. Mm. So was it un is it unusual for you to collaborate with a civilian scientist like Avi Loeb? I mean... Um so understand that you know, one of the things that we were charged to do was normalize this uh, research area and get it out of the conspiracy-minded uh, community and put it more into science and technology and national security and safety um, communities. This is where um, I think there was a big push to try to normalize this get it uh, away from the sensationalism and put some rigor behind it. So to put rigor behind something like that, you have to get the science community involved. The scientific community doesn't want to be involved because of the conspiracy late baggage that comes with it. Mm. So part of this was uh, working with select groups uh, across the academic community to try to get them into putting some scientific rigor behind their thinking and getting some of them to put some scientific rigor into analysis and hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So the way the scientific method works, right, you've got a hypothesis, you've got um, signatures and data that you expect to come out of that hypothesis. You go and you measure that, and if your data matches, then your theory is is correct, your hypothesis is correct. If it doesn't match, then it's not. So part of the, the uh, plan was to get the scientific community to start documenting in peer-reviewed journals different aspects of the 
hypothetical extraterrestrial um, hypothesis, if you will. So Abby, being one of the key scientific figures that is trying to prove um, advanced civilizations out in the universe, um, the purpose of engaging with him was to get him to put on paper the signatures associated with his hypothesis. If you actually look through that paper, which was never finished um, because it was put out as draft before we finished writing it, um, you'll see towards the back end of that, you know, the math and the physics of, okay, look, if there's something that's moving around as quickly as people believe, it would leave very specific physical signatures. If those phys physical signatures are not there when we go up to measure it, then that's probably not what that thing is doing. Mm -hmm. So that was the whole purpose of that uh, exercise, was to get that documented and you know, eventually put into a peer-reviewed journal. Now that one did not go. We I did do a Another one with the University of Utah that came out uh, around the holidays, and there's there's another one that we're finishing up right now that's looking at kind of statistical correlations of environmental factors and other aspects of, of observations that have to be factored in to any good scientific theory. You have to actually go through all. And um, the prevailing theory now is that it's, um, well, I say prevailing, it's the one that has the consensus, I suppose, is that it's a, a comet, with, but why, why, are they, why are they wrong about that? You mean Avi's? Uh... No, I mean, Avi thinks it's an artificial interstellar object, but I think other researchers uh, suggested yeah. it's a, a comet that's emitting small amounts of... Um, gas from an icy core, which is why you don't see a tail, because it's a small amount. Right. right. And it, if that's what fits the data, then that is what is the scientific theory that, that is supported by the data. Uh, the paper that I was working with him on was to put math to his theory, <coughs> so that it could either be proved or disproved. Mm -hmm. And it's been disproved. And uh, have you been following his expedition in the Pacific? I did. And what do you make of the components of the spherules he's found? He, he, he's, he's, his claim is that they're, they have a unique composition that you don't usually find uh, on, uh, on the Earth's surface. Well, I haven't read the scientific analysis and I haven't seen the rest of the community's an analysis and peer review of that. So I would leave it to the scientific community to do that, put it out in publication, and then I'd take a look at it. Sure. Um, so let's jump straight into the RO stuff. Can I talk about where, where this all started? I mean, for the public, this most recent um, spate of the UFO uh, craze, if you like, it, um, with the New York Times article. So those three videos that came out, do we know what gimbal is now? Because that's the one that everyone goes to, the one that looks like a flying saucer that rotates. Do you now yeah. have an idea of what that is? We have, again, we have had a hypothesis of uh, this is how the sensor operates on that particular platform. There are different types of sensors. Uh, that do different things. We uh, were, in, at least when I was there, I uh, was in the process of actually obtaining one of those to, to measure it. Because again, it's a what <coughs> can you measure, what can you recreate. Um, we did not get around to doing that before I retired, so I don't know where they are on that. But that is most likely uh, a sensor I won't say it's a, not an artifact, but that's just how the sensor operates. We see that in a number of different other sensors. Uh, but that needs to be proven. And to prove it, you've got to actually go get that platform, put it in an in a imaging chamber, and, and recreate that uh, whole path. 
One one of the theories out there put forward by a skeptic called Mick West is that it's glare from a, a heat source. Is that accurate? Do you think? In the case of gimbal. You mean as what the source is? So mm. the source could be any number of things, right? The source, and even a weather balloon will give off that kind of glare if it's mylar, if it's got enough shiny knit on it, sun's just right. So mm. all of that kind of analysis has to go into those kinds of uh, videos. Unfortunately, uh, there's not really enough, a whole lot of the information that we would need to do that level of analysis is not in that video. Right? You need the raw video, you need the raw data, and that raw data doesn't, uh, it's not available. And do, does that video cuts off for the public, but is there more of that video that you've seen? And no, there's no, there's no more. It just cuts off where it cuts off? Uh, that's when they stopped recording. Okay. Um and what about go fast? I mean, again, debunkers would say it's not going fast at all. It's going quite slowly, and it's a lot higher yeah. than they think. Yeah. So the the go fast one was uh, analyzed with the NASA team, uh, and it's definitely just uh, parallax. Now that has to be verified with with Aero, and then they will put it out on their website when they get to that. But that's not a uh, everything I saw from the NASA analysis uh, was was accurate to everything else uh, that we've seen parallax show up in. Mm. And um, Tic Tac, what what's your view on that? Uh, my view on Tic Tac is hasn't changed since the last time I met, talked about it. There's no data. There's not enough information to ever come to a conclusion. Um, so we can speculate about it all we want, but, you know, what's important for folks to understand is that, you know, these, these trained military pilots, they do see things, but they may not understand what they see any more than their sensors understand what they see. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's unusual or it's exotic or it's extraterrestrial. It just means that they don't understand what they're looking at right then. Mm. In the case of the Tic Tac, there's a lot of other hypotheses that's, that are still there that people tend to gloss over, like submersible launched uh, vehicles, uh, other uh, radar artifacts. I mean, one of the things that people, uh, again, don't, don't fully appreciate is a lot of the stuff that we see in these ranges, and, and I don't want to speak to Tic Tac in particular, but all of them, you know, come from when there's when there's these weird anomalous radar signatures. What people don't understand is that these are test wings. Test wings are testing new capabilities. And so new radars or new radar waveforms get artifacts in them. And that's why you're out there testing them, to try to figure out how do you optimize it so that it's working, so that it can be used in uh, regular operations. Um, some of these are, are just the fact that, hey, they're testing a new radar, and you don't know what, what it's doing until you get it sorted out and you got to dig into that data. Mm. All that takes time. As far as Tic Tac is concerned, there's a couple of other explanations that don't involve extraterrestrials that haven't been fully explored, but they aren't going to be able to because there's no data. You know, this is from years and years ago. Uh, none of that data was retained at the time because there wasn't a data retention policy in place for the department. Is, the is there one thing, now? There is. That was one of the first things that I did when I stood up Arrow was we put together a data retention policy and put it out to the joint staff. The joint staff issued it along with the reporting requirements that we standardized uh, last year. So all of that is out there. Now it's a question of what can they see and collect and how can they process all that data when they get it. Hmm. And how, how 
do the typical day unfold at Arrow? I mean, do you just reach out to witnesses? Do people reach out to you? I, I, how did you go about your daily business, you know? Well, are you talking about the historical research or are you talking about the operational mission? Well, I'd say contemporary information, yeah. So all the operational mission. Mm. Um, so every day, uh, all of the reporting from the services is collected and gone through and logged if there are any cases that are reported as UAP uh, and turned into uh, uh, data files. And a lot of this is data processing and data management and then understanding what we have to work with. Now, under, you know, you got to understand some of the, the new guidance that we had put out takes time to implement. Right, so all the services have to figure out how they're going to retain all this data and how they're going to transmit it to Arrow and to the, the relevant combatant commands. So the other thing is you've got all the combatant commands that need to also know what's going on in their area of responsibility. Mm. So um, all of that is, was in play, but in a, in a typical day, any of those reports that would come in uh, from the different services would get logged, turned into cases. Um, there'd be a quick look through on what, uh, um, you know, what data was available and whether or not it rose to a level of priority where we would want to, uh, you know, move that up in the list of analysis. That's just the reporting and analysis piece. And there's the collection management to uh, um, align all of our collection capabilities uh, to try and search and find any of these things. Mm -hmm. And there's the S&T line of effort where we're looking at the, the science and the technology across the globe. Are there any new cutting edge technologies? Are there things that we can use for tracking and detection? Are there things that other people are working on that might meet some of these signatures that we're seeing? You know, one of the things that I had talked about last year was, you know, people uh, sometimes, you know, these pilots they'll say, hey, I saw something that it looks like it was maneuvering and it doesn't look like it had any uh, means of propulsion, visible means of propulsion, or visible means of maneuvering. Well, there's lots of technologies that are state-of-the-art today and have been for the last decade or two that would present those kinds of signatures. Really? And so mm. just trying to understand what's the current state-of-the-art of technologies that are out there uh, is an important piece of this, right? Understanding how, how do we... What's advanced aerospace platforms look like? There are commercial, you know, drone companies that are that are pushing the state of the art uh, that that people just need to understand and recognize. You know, this this whole thing about the uh, the cubes in a sphere. Oh yeah, yeah. Ryan Graves mentioned that, didn't he? Right, right. Well, you know, there was there were some academic articles that I. Uh, some of my research team found uh, from a couple of years ago, uh, back in 21, 22, um, with a Chinese and Singapore uh, group, uh, two groups, uh, where they were actually, they had built and were flying uh, spherical drones that had cubes in them. And why would they do that? Well, according to the research, they were looking for what's the, what's the next gen of, of drones. That's, there, there's a lot of spherical drone work for a lot of good reasons. Yeah. Uh, and how do you make a drone like that maneuver around without propellers that are visible? Yeah. And what, one of the reasons you, you make a spherical drone is for indoor use because it's safer. Um, or in stadiums, which is outdoor, because it's safer. Because if it crashes into the crowd, it's not going to cut people and hurt them. Um, wow. So these are basically 
you know, what they do is where the, where the cube touches the sphere in all the corners, they fuse it, they cut it out, and they stick, um, either small turbo fans or in some cases, uh, different propulsion, jet propulsion, air propulsion systems. And so now I have eight of these around this sphere and that gives you the greatest fidelity and maneuvering the sphere around using a controller inside this. Wow. Now, why is this important? Well, there is a, there is an example of a cube in a sphere drone that exists today, uh, you know, that doesn't require aliens. Now, what people will say, and again, this goes back to people don't actually understand how the national security world works. Um, people will say, well, that was a couple of years ago. And what the pilots were saying was they saw this, you know, 15 years ago. Well, this is how the, the classified world works. If, if I am a nation state, and I have an advanced technology that I'm working on, um, I will classify it, and I will not let my scientists say anything about it or publish on it until I get to a point where I've got a capability that I feel comfortable with and the rest of the, say, academic world has started to catch up or the scientific world has started to catch up. At that point, then, they may let some of the scientists or associated companies, you know, publish on some of the basics that don't give away their their secret sauce or their secret capabilities. Mm. So they'll see publications on these things, but it's usually a decade or two after the fact. So how far ahead is the U.S. military than how far ahead of the public is it? in terms of technological advances? Uh, I, I couldn't say. Um, and it all depends on, on which areas you're looking at. I mean, this, this, is, a, this is how the, the military uh, labs operate, the DOE labs operate, all the national and military labs are full of a bunch of scientists. I came out of one. This is what we do, right? We do in research and then, you know, we'll, we'll try to write some papers. We'll write some papers on some of the basic physics. Mm. But you won't get any of the unclassified papers on, on any of the more advanced stuff until much further down the line. Well, that's true in every country. And China's just, and they're as bad as anybody else, if not worse, than when they let their scientists publish it at all. Mm. Uh, so it has not surprised me at all that a capability like like that you would see today in an academic publication. I don't know that there is a, a country that had a classified program, but it, it stands to reason in the national security world that that is a possibility. Yeah. And all I'm saying is, here is a possibility that does not have anything to do. Excuse me. With aliens. <sighs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just getting um. Yep. Um. Set. So. <coughs> sorry. Excuse me. Um. So <laughs> some of these witnesses have described, you know, hypersonic speeds and and turns at right angles that defy the laws of physics as they see it. I mean, does the, gov does the U.S. government or other governments have that sort of capability? So I go back to my earlier statement. If you dig into all of those, of the data that we have on those, it almost always turns out to be an optical illusion, a sensor anomaly, or some other um, uh, weird aspect of how that data was collected. And it inevitably does not turn out to be that it's traveling at hypersonic velocities or making right angle turns. Mm -hmm. I mean, my favorite one is the right angle turn that, you know, there was a video of and that is, as we recreated, you know, here's the platform going around and the sensor underneath it is turning at the same time and they're banking. And when you put all that together and you recreate it, 
the, the object wasn't moving hardly at all. It was moving with the wind. Mm. But it, it appears that it's moving, you know, crazy because you are you don't have a reference frame. It's, it's just like relativity. You don't have a reference frame. And unless you have an inertial reference frame that you can pin it to, it's going to look weird. Mm. And pilots are, aren't infallible, are they? So they're just as vulnerable to optic collisions as the rest of us are, I suppose. Absolutely, they are. Mm. And it happens. I mean, it, it, it happens. So is is Aro based out of the Pentagon? It's at the building, and you worked in the building, the Pentagon, or is it? Um, so Aro is in a non-disclosed location because we don't need a lot of crazy people at the door. Right, I get it. <laughs> That's always made me wonder about Area Fifty One. If they really did have things there, then they're not there now, are they? Because you wouldn't want to attract all the crazies, like you said. Um, but from a young boy's perspective, someone who's interested in that topic, I mean, having a job at the Pentagon hunting aliens sounds really exciting. Is it exciting? Did you enjoy the work? I enjoyed the operational mission. Right. I, 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 the historical research, while interesting, um, coupled with the, uh, allegations became uh, most of my time, mm. um, which is not where I needed to be. Mm. And the, the rest of my team, you know, I, I kept them focused on the operational mission because that's where they needed to go. Um, that was the most important part of Arrow and still is today, is the safety and security and the national um, security issues attendant to that. Mm. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the team of debriefers and I focused on the research. Uh, and again, while interesting, um, you know, at the end, we're spending a lot of time and effort because of the, you know, group of people that, that have, have you know, lobbied into uh, the attention of, of Congress to make this go. Yeah, and you've talked about um, a circular reporting um, cycle that's going on. Um, can I, I'm just, just going to read some names to you, right? George Knapp, Lou Elizondo, Jeremy Corbell, Christopher Mell, and Jay Stratton. Are those some of the names were involved in this self-repeating circle? So, I can't name specific names because the legislation wrote, um, you know, extended the whistleblower protections to anybody that came to speak to us and anybody that uh, we, we call out. So there are, there are Privacy Act uh, restrictions. There are uh, uh, whistleblower restrictions, uh, which is why in the report there are no names, just numbers. Is the Department of Defense embarrassed that it got duped by Robert Bigelow to to get 22 million to investigate ghosts and skinwalkers and things? So the reason uh, that part is in there is because that's already out in the public domain. Mm -hmm. That's already been documented and that's already out there. So I don't have anything to to add on to that. Um, I think what you'll find is you can probably you know do the analysis and figure out. Who, uh, and I'm sure there will be people that will try to do that, um, but that's not my job. And our job was to, you know, um, document everything, investigate it, and protect the, the identities. Now, interestingly enough, the some of the legislation, including the extension of the whistleblower protections to these these folks, was actually ghost written by some of these same people who had lobbied Congress. Right. So they they managed to write themselves in, you know, their own protections to allow them to go do some of this stuff. So there's that's a that's an interesting thing that somebody needs to go investigate, but it's not Arrow's job. 
So, so when David Grush testified in Congress that he'd been told that the US government is in possession of alien spacecraft, which they're reverse engineering, and they not only that, but they have alien bodies. And he said somebody told told him this, somebody he trusts. I mean, are we talking about that same circle? Yep. Right. So the, the people who lobbied for this programme in the first place are the same people who told him that they that they have these things. Okay. Um, it's even better than that. So if you look in the historical report on page 36, you'll see one, two, three, four, four or five main bullets there that speak to the same group of people who had their hands and everything from, um, you know, purported material exploitation to congressional lobbying and, 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 and uh, writing of legislation to expanding um, uh, legitimate special access programs for Know, purportedly for alien and extraterrestrial exploitation, which they weren't supposed to do. You know, there's a lot of things there that all of these same people were involved in, mm-hmm. including um, some of the same ones were involved in the uh, in the uh, think tank study that's that's called out in there. Uh, it's just it, it's it's all the same group. Do you think this is a blemish on the Department of Defense, the fact that this was allowed to happen? Does it speak to maybe the way you, the, the Department vets programs and the way it organizes itself? No, no. Um, I think in this case, uh, you know, once the department um, understood what was happening, they put a stop to it. Right. Um, and and because of that, um, the you know Senator Harry Reid at the time um, used some of these uh, you know collaborated with some of these same people and went over to DHS to try to get that program stood up. That's really the new part of this is that DHS piece, uh, which had been alleged as being you know one of the hiding places for extraterrestrial um, bodies uh, turned out to not be that. It turned out to be this kind of same group of people trying to stand up a program under DHS because the Department of Defense shut it down. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's you know, a little bit of investigative work that we have laid out to kind of put all these pieces together. Mm. That's what's all out there in that report. And, you know, the, the DHS package, I believe, is in its final review for public release. So that'll be put out. When um, I look at the other conspiracies like the JFK assassination, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who is undoubtedly the shooter as far as I'm concerned, but... Um, but He's often described as a patsy by conspiracy theorists. Do you think David Grush is a patsy of this UFO lobby, that he's been told this stuff because he's a useful idiot and he's gone forward with it? I, I don't know. I don't want to speculate on, on people's motivations. That Again, that wasn't our, our remit. Our remit was to lay out the evidence and investigate the allegations and the evidence, you know, is pretty conclusive of there's no evidence to support any of the allegations or any extraterrestrial reverse engineering or not human biologics or whatever you want to call it. But what's interesting is that you know, some of the language that was used in the open testimony by, by Mr. Grush and others uh, is actually the same language that was in the original story back in the 60s, and then again in the 
80s, 90s. So if you look at this story historically, and, and some of that is in the historical report that's online now, you see this story crop up every every couple of decades, and it's the same, pretty much it's the same story. A bit like the virgin birth in different um, religious texts. Um, Sometimes. Has David Grush ever been in touch with you during your time at Ar- Arrow? Not at Arrow. We tried to reach out to him four or five times to get him to come in, and, and as of the time that I left, he had not and refused to come for a variety of reasons that we tried to answer. I and believe can you- all that at this point. And can you disclose those reasons he gave? Uh, I think you should wait till the FOIA comes out. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a few things. A lot of these people involved in this UFO lobby are quite scathing of you and quite, you know, abusive, you know, you've been called a liar, a spin doctor, um, and, you know, there's some sinister overtones to it all. I mean, how has that affected you? Well, it's been much worse than that. I mean, I've had people come to my house, I've had people threaten my wife and daughter, I've had people mm-hmm. try to break into our uh, online accounts, I've had uh, a lot more than far more than I ever had as, you know, the deputy director of intelligence. Um, you know, I didn't have China and Russia trying to get on me as much as these people are. And, and you know, does it bother me? It bothers me when they come after my family. Um, does not bother me to the point of, um, you know, caring that much other than every one of them have been turned over to the FBI for investigation. So, you know, they can make all the threats they want. I just turn it all over for OSI and FBI to go and law enforcement to go investigate. And and, 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 and I'm guessing you can't tell me who the individuals are, but can you speak around that in the sense that are they people prominent in this whole UFO community? So there's certainly a number of, of um, you know, really true believers in the in the uh, conspiracy. Obviously, there's a lot of people that that uh, are never going to believe anything that Arrow is going to come up with. I had one one person, you know, send uh, an email about you know, why would anybody believe you know the Pentagon and. Congress is not going to believe the Pentagon, and so, you know, why even bother? And, and the answer is simple. Well, if Congress didn't want to believe us, then Congress shouldn't have written it into law for us to go investigate. Um, I mean, Congress writes the laws. Congress should have done it. But have, now, here's the other, you know, here's the other piece of this that, that uh, I just want to make sure we're all clear, right? There are a lot of good people in Congress that are trying hard to get to the truth of this. Most of them are on the Senate side. Um, You know, the Intel and Defense Committees in particular are very, very, very concerned about the safety and security aspects of this mission space, and rightfully so, right? We don't want this to be an intelligence surprise. We don't want this to be a technology surprise. Um, that being said, there's a handful of folks that are, you know, in Congress that are mostly on the House side, very, um, you know, true believing, Pentagon's lying, there's a government conspiracy and a cover-up, and, you know, why would we ever believe that? Well, you know, the first thing I would say, and I, I've said this before, uh, I think I said this in my first op-ed, of, you know, those folks, they never, ever asked for a briefing from Arrow in the entire time I was there. 
They never asked for an update. They never even bothered to inquire about anything that they put out into the public space before they did it. Is this Tim uh, Bersha at all? At all? This is, yeah, this is the house side. Predominantly, this is the house side, right? So the, you know, the, the thoughts of, hey, you know, if you guys want to get at the, at the, uh, truth of this, first of all, Congress stood us up to go investigate that. And, you know, you should make use of the tools you stood up to get to answers that you want. Mm at least the truth that you want to find out. It may not be the answer you want, and often that's the case. The the other piece of that is, um, you know, they really need to uh, spend some time listening to what has been found before they jump out into... You know, the public space and, and decry, you know, the Pentagon's hiding something from them. What, what certainly many of the American people don't recognize, and I put this in my second op-ed, and what I'm certain that you know, most of the global community has never paid attention to, is, and I wouldn't expect them to, is how the U.S. Congress works when it comes to access to classified information. Classified information is controlled by the Defense and Intel Committees or Defense and Intel Classified Information. Um, And so if a congressional member who is not on those committees wants, you know, shows up at a military base and wants access to classified information, they're not going to get it unless their own congressional defense and intel committees gives them access. That's not the department or the IC's call or responsibility. They have to go to their own committees to request access and justify that. And then those committees will tell the department or the IC, yes, you may brief, you know, member so-and-so on whatever it is they're asking about. But if they don't say that, if they don't do that, the department and the IC can't really do anything. It's a security violation. Mm. But, it, you know, most people don't know that. And instead, you get members that go, oh, they're hiding information from us. Well, yeah, I clear. Were any of the witnesses you interviewed under oath? So all of them put, we transcribed their testimony to us, and then they signed a piece of paper that, that attested to the accuracy. They were able to change or write or edit whatever they wanted, and then they signed it and said this was accurate to the best of their knowledge. In fairness to true believers, I suppose, if, if you go to a private company or a, a, a decompartmentalized part of government and ask them about reverse engineering projects or what, and whatnot, if they want to keep that secret, they're going to lie to you, aren't they? I mean, how, how, yeah. how did, how do you know that you're not being lied to? I suppose you just, is it just on trust alone or is there empirical? So it's a couple of things. One, uh, We were cleared to everything that those industry partners were working on before we showed up. Two, uh, most of the people at the senior level that I interacted with, certainly, and many of my team, uh, are people that have worked with the department for many years. Uh, We've known them. We know who they are. We know what programs they have. We know what they're doing. and there is a, you know, there's a relationship between the industrial base and the department because if they, if they aren't being truthful, you know, that, that hurts their chances with the department and future acquisition when you're talking about them. Um, 
Um, and then we cross check. So, you know, I know there's a, there's a favorite part of this story of, you know, A, stuff was abandoned with uh, an industry partner and they're hiding it. Well, no, they're not. And, and I went and checked with those people. And here's where this gets really interesting is some of that same core group of, of individuals that we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. right? Uh, had, um, reached out to one of these industry partners and convinced them to take a look at a piece of material uh, that they claimed was part of a crashed UFO and then turned around to point to that company and say, hey, they're exploiting, you know, they're reverse engineering crashed UFOs. Well, they were the ones that gave it to them. <laughs> that is and, ridiculous. And then once we actually got control of that little project and took a look at it, it turned out that's yeah, not really a UFO. It's most likely a piece of a missile casing from an Air Force test uh, back in the 60s or 50s. So, so this is the kind of, of, of um, yeah. circular accusations that have been going on of you got a group of people that, that start something, and then they go out and say, they're doing this, right? So the same group of people who expanded this uh, special access program that they weren't supposed to, then go out and say, there's a hidden special access program that has UAP, UFO stuff in it. I'm like, well, yeah, because you expanded it. There's <laughs> I mean, it's like setting fire to a building and calling the news, or better yet, filming the news and sending it off. That's. It's, right. Can you tell so me who that private company was? Like who they sent this material to? No, that's a shame. No, well, I mean, we have to protect companies as much as we protect the individuals. So um, all of that has been given to the appropriate oversight folks at that in Congress. So there is, you know, at, at the senior leadership in Congress are the ones that get access to all of the actual data at that level. Uh, again, I'm going to ask you to speculate, but what do you think their motivation is here? I mean, are they grifters in the purest sense of the word? They know they're lying, they're, um, they're trying to fool people. Or uh, do they genu genuinely believe this stuff and are just a bit irrational about it? So I don't let, you know, much like UAP, there's no one explanation, right? Mm -hmm. well, when it comes to motivations of people. And I, I don't know why individuals do the things they do. Um, you know, I'm a, I, as an intelligence officer and, and a physicist, I'm a, I'm a technical collector, not a human collector. Um, that is a different type of intelligence officer. So, I don't know motivations, and we weren't asked to, to find out. But what I have told people in the past, including Congress, uh, you know, there's there's generally a handful of motivations that that you can think of, right? So there's there's clearly monetary value. There's a huge market to keep this kind of conspiracy going. Everything from TV shows to you know movies and whatever. You know, companies that are stood up to go investigate things. There's fame. Um, there's there's influence in the sense of, hey, if I can get, um, you know, some some people on the hill excited about this, whether it's staffers or members, and they want to, you know, keep talking to me, then there's a there's a uh, you know, there, it's not really a power, but an influence, uh, you know, uh, motivation. Uh, there's, there's the absolute true belief, uh, which I would, I would, I would, uh, suggest is more akin to a religion than an actual, you know, factual thing. And those are the people that you're never going to convince, no matter what you put in front of them. I could lay out, you know, I could lay out the pictures of the classified programs that they mistook and they still wouldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. right? They would say, no, that, 
you know, was derived from alien technology. Um, and then there, you know, there's people that have, you know, there are some that unfortunately have clear issues. Um, I've got a person that communicates with me often, um, trying to, um, come to grips with something that, that they think they've, they've seen and, and they're working through you know, what can only be described as mental health issues. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it, you know, take your pick. It could be any of those. It could be none of those. It could just be, I want to go do this, right? Mm. Um, interestingly, and, and I'll, I'll have to, we'll have to start wrapping up here in a moment. Um, interestingly, yeah. um, you know, what I would leave you with on that topic is, you know, there is the potential for um, intentional disinformation, misinformation, you know, relative to this kind of missionary because it's so divisive. It's just another example of how, you know, somebody could, could use this in a, in a societal divide to exacerbate um you know, uh, um, anger against the government, anger against uh, me, anger against other uh, aspects of, of this mission space. Um, because people want to believe, they want to believe in things like alien technology because they don't want to be alone in the universe and they want to, they want to believe that there's a reason things are, are the way they are. Mm. That's not necessarily where you want to put your focus, but I don't speak for people, right? I just speak for what we've found, what's the evidence and what are the facts. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go in a second. Um, I am, um, I am um, asked some ufologists in the interest of the balance if they had any questions for you. So I just selected a, a few, uh, if you don't mind, if I could put those to you. Um, one of the interesting ones I thought was if the government had found evidence of aliens and spaceships and whatnot, would they have disclosed it to the public by now? Or is it the kind of thing they would keep secret? Yeah, they would keep that secret because it's not, it's not their job, right? I mean, if, if there was, first of all, if the Department of Defense or the intelligence community found evidence of any sort of extraterrestrial. It's not their job. It would immediately get turned over to NASA, and NASA would immediately disclose to everybody. It's That's their job. That's why we had a partnership with NASA for, <coughs> well, one, for investigating advanced aerospace technologies that already exist, but two, I mean, that's their job. Mm. Right? That's why there was an UAP independent study from NASA. And this is from one of your critics, Jeremy Corbell. He said, there are many small errors in the report, such as Senator Reid representing New Mexico. If these are wrong, how can we trust rigor of work conducted when it comes to the major allegations? Well, that would be a technical editing review question that I would have to put back to Hera. Mm. And finally, do you think your report will stand up to the test of time? I think all of the evidence that's been put in place and laid uh, in front of Congress uh, will certainly stand the test of time. Great. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, do you have anything else to add, or do you think we've covered everything? No, I think that's pretty much it. Great. Well, um, <clears throat> once again, thanks so much for agreeing to talk to me. I know you don't have a lot of, uh, you're very busy and uh, you don't like doing these and you know, I don't blame you because I wouldn't like doing, my, doing them either. Um, but can I email you any further questions if anything occurs to me while I write this up? Would that be all right? That'd be, that'd be fine. Um, yeah, you can email them to me. I don't know how timely I can get to them or even if I can, but I'll, I'll try to get to them. Okay, Sean. Well, thanks very much and, um, have a enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Take care. Okay. <clears throat>